Let's open our Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 1. Last week we talked about the shepherds. This week we're going to go a little bit backwards, a little bit back to the home of Zacharias and Elizabeth. They had had that Christmas story too. Zacharias had gone to the temple there to fulfill his work as a priest. There he was chosen by Lot and his, and his family was allowed to go into the temple and do the work of the priest. Zacharias had gone to the golden altar, the altar of incense, and had been placing the incense there upon the altar when the angel Gabriel spoke to him and told him that there was coming a child. Of course, Zacharias couldn't believe it. He said, we're old. My wife is old. I am old. We're beyond childbearing. And the angel struck him mute because he refused to believe the word of God. And then eventually there through the time and Elizabeth had carried the child full term and Mary had left the city of Nazareth, had gone down to be with Elizabeth. She too had been, buried, had been impregnated by the Holy Spirit. And we see that Zacharias is there at the birth of John and he gives him the name of John and his voice is returned. Zacharias, both Zacharias and Elizabeth were very special people. As Mary was a very righteous woman, a very virtuous woman, Elizabeth and Zacharias were righteous people too. We note Zacharias' submission to the Holy Spirit in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 66 and verse 67. In verse 66, the Bible says, And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts, saying, What kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. The way in the, in the living, excuse me, in the tree of life version, it says, For the hand of Adonai was on him. And in verse 67, the Bible says, Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. When Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit, he prophesied about Jesus, about the coming of the Messiah. We note in verse 41 of that same chapter, back in verse 41, we see Elizabeth's submission to the Holy Spirit. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. We see that Elizabeth and Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit. This is different than what the Old Testament people were common, and that was that the Holy Spirit would come upon them. Now we see that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, which means that they were under the control. They were in submission to the will of the Holy Spirit. And as Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, she began to praise God with the coming of the Messiah. But when Zacharias was Filled with the Holy Spirit, he began to prophesy about the coming of the Messiah, Jesus. We start with verse 68. We see here that the Messiah has come or is going to come. And we see that that prophecy was foretold about Mary and the birth of her child. In Luke chapter 1, <clears throat> starting with verse 68, we see, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. And has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, we have been since, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life and you child will be called the prophet of the highest for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. We see two things today about this prophetic uh, uh, sharing of Zacharias to the family and the friends around him. 
First of all, we see it's a message about the Messiah, the son of David. And then we see also it's a message about the Messiah, the son of Abraham. These two have very important matters in the aspect of the Christmas story. Christmas is a time of the birth of Jesus, but it's not just another baby being born into the world. Babies have been being born into the world since after the Garden of Eden was closed. Children had been, been coming forth for many, many, many thousands of years, but this child was different. It was a prophecy all of this child we're going to see in a moment all the way back from the beginning of time, as the scripture text says. We see that it was a promise by God, and God gave us some ideas. God gave us some clues about who this Messiah was going to be. He said he was going to be a son of David. He was going to be a son of Abraham. We see in verses 68 through 71 that this coming of the son of David was in relationship to his first coming as a direct fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, that there would be a king for Israel that a king would be born, a king after the order of David. We see that the son of divinity would come, a redeemer in verse 68. The Bible says, blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. The purpose of the coming of Jesus was not just to give the, the shepherds that night something to talk about. He came for a purpose in the land of Israel, but not only for the people of Israel, but for the entire world. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He came as a redeemer. <clears throat> a redeemer was promised. The Bible says in verse 68, blessed is the Lord God of Israel. Why would the Lord God of Israel be blessed? because he had promised the Redeemer. And that promise came all the way from the Garden of Eden. The Bible talks about from the beginning of time, that this promise had begun from the beginning of time. When did time begin, beloved? We see in the book of Genesis how time was given to us. It was the first day, it was the second day, it was the third day. God established time for us when he began the creation of all things. And there when the garden had been established, time had been given to us. And from that very moment, God knew in his heart of hearts that there would be needed a redeemer in this world. And we see that when Adam and Eve failed, when Adam and Eve had fallen and they'd eaten the fruit, God promised them a redeemer. God promised them, though death was coming, there would come a redeemer. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, he's cursing the serpent. He's cursing Satan, who had allowed himself to go into that serpent and use that serpent to, to deceive Eve. And he curses that serpent and says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Your seed would be the Antichrist, Satan. Her seed would be the Messiah, Jesus. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Oh, beloved, we see the promise. What is called or known among Bible students as the protevangelum, the first gospel. All the way back in Genesis, all the way back in the garden, before Adam and Eve had been sent out into the world, God gave them a promise. And that promise was that the Messiah was coming. A redeemer was coming. That they would not have to fall prey to this matter called death. That though death would come, there would be a promise that a redeemer would be coming to. So we see his promise in the garden, but we see his promise of grace. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11, the prophet says, He shall see the labor of his soul, speaking of Jesus, and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. <clears throat> the doctrine of justification is very simple. That Jesus came to redeem us. 
that Jesus came as the Messiah that Christmas morning, born in a cave, placed in a manger. This little child had come into this world to redeem all of us from the curse of sin, from the penalty of death. And we see the promise of his grace would come and that God would see his righteous servant, the Messiah, who would justify many. That means he would forgive their sins. And that word justification means just as if I never sinned. That when Jesus died on the cross, your sins and my sins and all the sins of the world were placed upon Jesus that day. All the sins that Adam and Eve had sinned there in the garden and after the garden, they had been placed upon Jesus. That when he went down into Sheol there upon after the cross, the death of the cross, he went down into Sheol and preached to the prisoners who had been captive there. And lo and behold, they were they were sent to heaven after that point, after they received the Messiah. So we see not only was his promise made in a garden, but his promise was of grace, that you and I would have hope, that you and I would have help through the Messiah, Jesus. And we see a redeemer was promised in verse 68, and then a redeemer is provided, for he has visited and redeemed his people. A redeemer for his praise. Keep your ribbon here in Luke and turn to the book of Psalms. Usually if you turn right to the middle of your Bible, you're right there in Psalms. In Psalm chapter 67. Psalm chapter 67. Starting with verse 1. God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, Selah, that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the people, peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We see here in verse 68 of Luke chapter 1, for he has visited and redeemed his people, a promise of a redeemer in the Psalms. And then we see a redeemer not only for praise, but we see a redeemer for people. Oh, beloved, we see that that redeemer coming, we praise God, we bring honor and glory to him for all that God has done for us, bringing us the redeemer, bringing us the Messiah, Jesus. And this time of Christmas is the beginning of his ministry. But we also see he came as a redeemer for all people. Turn a little bit to the left to the first chapter of Luke, uh, starting with verse 16, a little bit to your left. The Bible says that the angel is talking to Mary and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Excuse me, speaking to, to uh, uh, Zacharias. He also has gone before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the, to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The Messiah was coming. John the Baptist would be a forerunner. Here Zacharias understands the angel is saying to him he's going to be a forerunner of the Messiah. And so Zacharias is looking at this child that's just been born. And God gives him this message of prophecy. We see he was the son of divinity, a redeemer. But also we see that the Messiah would come as a son of David, a rescuer. In verse 69 and through 71, we see this son of David, the rescuer. We see his prophesied salvation in verse 69 and 70. The Bible says in verse 69, the provision. He calls the provision of the Messiah the horn of salvation. Look at verse 69. And he raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. We see that this horn of salvation is none other than the Messiah. The horn of salvation speaks of power, speaks of authority. 
And we see that the Messiah is going to come as the great authority, the great Messiah of God. The Bible says in Psalm 132 and verse 17, There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. He's going to show the world that the anointed is here. The anointed is another Old Testament phrase for the term Messiah, the anointed one. Jesus was going to be born of the, of the lineage of David. He was going to come forth out of the lineage of David as a horn of salvation. Joseph, who was the stepfather, who was the legal guardian of Jesus, he was not the real father of Jesus, but he had a connection there with the, with the lineage of David. He too was born of the lineage of David, he was born from the family relating to Solomon himself. And there he saw that his lineage, David, was of the royal lineage of Jesus. David may have had, or excuse me, the royal lineage of Solomon. He may have had a, a, a claim to the throne of Israel. But we see that he was going to go to Bethlehem because he was of the lineage of David. And therefore, we see not only this lineage of David with Joseph, but also Mary herself was from the lineage of David. As the Gospels in the book of Matthew show us Joseph's lineage, Luke shows us in the third chapter of Luke the lineage of Mary. And she is with the family of David through the lineage of David, through David's son Nathan, the brother of Solomon. Both Solomon and Nathan were from the family of David and Bathsheba. And so we see this couple had a very good, strong Davidic background. We see the provision, the horn of salvation. We see the promise, the Davidic covenant in verse 70, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the world began, since time began. That prophecy began in the garden and continued all through the Old Testament, talking about the coming of the Messiah all the way up to the time of David and Solomon and on further on past that. We see God had promised David that someone would be on his throne forever, that there would always be a son of David upon the throne of, uh, of uh, Israel there in the land of Israel. He accomplishes this through the Messiah. You see, today there is no king in Israel. Today you go to Jerusalem, you'll find a prime minister, and you'll find a president. But there is no king in Israel right now. But, oh, beloved, there is a king of the Jewish people. And he is alive today, seated upon the throne of David, there in heaven, next to God himself, there enthroned in glory as the King of kings and Lord of lords is Jesus, the Messiah. And one day he'll come and he'll put that throne in Jerusalem there in the temple and he'll rule and reign for a thousand years in this world. But we see that he accomplishes this through the Messiah in Psalm 132. Starting with verse 10, it says, For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed. The Lord has sworn in truth to David, he will not turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of your body. If your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony, which I shall teach them, their sons also shall sit upon your throne forevermore. We see that when the children of Israel returned, the last king of Judah was there at the time of the Babylonian captivity. When the Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem, the king was dethroned. And we see that there was no return from a king of the family of David, even in the time of Jesus. There in the time of Jesus, there was a king. His name was Herod. Herod was not Jewish. Herod was an Edomian otherwise known as an Edomite. He was from the family of Esau, not from the family of Jacob. 
and the family of Jacob and the family of Esau had been against one another for countless years. They had helped the Babylonians in the destruction of Jerusalem. They'd helped the Babylonians in the capture of the Jewish people. In fact, when Moses had come back from Egypt, the Edomites would not even allow them to go through their land to go to the promised land. And so we see that Herod was king, but he was not the Messiah. He was not of the family of David. And so we see a prophesied salvation and a provision of salvation in verse 71. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. We see in verse 71, saved from the presence of our enemies. You see, we have three major enemies in our life. First of all, there is the world system. The world system. I saw a t-shirt years ago when I was walking through around Fort Wayne. I think it was at a Three Rivers Festival. The t-shirt said, do unto others before they do unto you. And I thought, boy, that, that's just the way the world is, isn't it? Back in the 60s and 70s, they had commercials on TV. Grab for all the gusto you can get. I remember seeing all those commercials. Grab for everything you can get. Hold tight to all the things this world can give you, folks. That's the philosophy of the world. That's the philosophy of the world system. But then we see also our enemy, Satan, and his, his minions. Satan is our enemy. He's the enemy of God. He is our enemy, too. He's the enemy of humanity in this world. He comes to seek those he can kill and destroy. The Bible says also that our own sinful self is our, our enemy. Oh, I think it was Charles Swindoll that said, if I could kick in the seat of the pants, the man who causes me the most trouble, I wouldn't sit down for a week. We are our own sinful self. In 1 John chapter 2, starting with verse 15, 1 John chapter 2, starting with verse 15. The Bible says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Jesus came to take care of our enemies Give us authority. Give us victory over our own enemies. And then we see we are saved from the purpose of our enemies. And what is that in verse 71? From all the hands of all who hate us. And what is that? Death. Sin is the number one cause of death. Sin is in this world, beloved. It permeates everywhere you go. It permeates your workplace. It permeates the place where you go and shop. It, takes, it permeates the grocery store. It permeates the other stores you go to, the mall, all the places of, of the halls of justice, the halls of government. All over this world, sin infiltrates everywhere. And we see that the wages of sin is death. And the Bible says that Jesus came to give us victory over death. John 10.10 10 says the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Jesus came to overcome the sin factor of this world. That death is a result of sin. And therefore Jesus came to cancel that debt and give us life eternal. So we see that, that the Messiah was going to come from King David. But then we also see that Zacharias begins to talk about Abraham. In verse 72 through 75, he talks about the Messiah, the son of Abraham. In a relationship, this is not to his first advent, but rather to a direct fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant and his second advent, his second coming. There are two major factors in the Abrahamic covenant. There are many facets of it, but the two major ones is this. It's a love grant. He says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. 
And we see and understand that God loved Abraham and he loved the people of Abraham. And he said, I'm going to come and bring a provision of grace for you. We see that this love grant was given to Abraham to promise the coming of Jesus. And then this land grant, he said, I'm going to give you this land. And that land grant speaks of the second coming of Jesus. When Jesus comes and establishes the kingdom there in Israel. In verse 72 through 73, we see his provision of grace. He says here, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. What is that holy covenant but the covenant of the Abrahamic covenant? We see a provision of mercy. To perform mercy promised to our fathers. You see, Jesus didn't come to, to condemn us. Oh, I love that scripture, John 3, 16, as I quoted earlier, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But very few people go a little further in verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, there is the coming of Jesus that he didn't come to condemn the world, but he came to save us. Gave us a provision of mercy. Promised to our fathers all the way back into the Garden of Eden. All the way back from the covenant of Abraham that went from Abraham to Isaac. And from Isaac to Jacob and to Jacob to his 12 sons. And eventually to those who believe in the, in the Lamb of God, who believe in the Messiah Jesus, that we too might have that promise of life through the Abrahamic covenant, a provision of mercy promised to our fathers. And then it was a promise of his mercy to remember his holy covenant. It was God's promise that he gave to Abraham. Oh, beloved, listen, when God gives a promise, bank on it. It is real and he's going to hold it true to the end. God is not a liar. God does not speak and change his mind. We see here that this particular uh, promise or covenant that he'd given to, to Abraham was a promise given. There we see in Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 42, he says, Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. I will remember, I will remember the land. He's speaking not only of the Abrahamic covenant promise of the coming of the Messiah, but also of the coming of the kingdom. That we might know that this little baby that was born in a manger, this little baby that was born in Bethlehem, was the king eternal of all things and all matters, of all, not only the earth, but upon the old, of all creation, and of all the worlds. We see that he is a king of kings and lord of lords. And then verse 73, we see an instrument of righteousness. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham. Again, God gave his word. God gave his oath. God gave his promise to Abraham, Father Abraham. And for those who have received Christ as their Lord and Savior, we are engrafted in, as the book of Romans, as Paul talks about, you and I are grafted into the Abrahamic covenant. We are engrafted into the olive tree. Not to replace Israel, but to be given place in the tree and there in the roots and the branches of the olive tree. We see a prophesied salvation next in verse 69 and 70. And he has, excuse me, I'm sorry, I got the wrong, <laughs> got the wrong point there. We see in verse 72 an intervention of remembrance. In verse 73 we see an instrument of righteousness. In verse 73 the oath which he swore to our father Abraham speaks of God's holy provision. The Abrahamic covenant was given in chapter 12 of Genesis. In chapter 12 of Genesis, starting with verse 1, 
The Bible speaks of this beginning of the Abrahamic covenant. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This was promised to our fathers. A provision of mercy. This was God's holy provision. God's love grant to the people of Israel and to those who believe in the Messiah as God's holy promise. God's love grant to the world was simple. God's love grant to the world was unique. It was fashioned and formed and focused in one individual that Christmas morning in Bethlehem. That little baby in the manger was God's focus of love grant to the world. Oh, the angels said very simply, did they not? Joy to the world. Joy to the world. Oh, beloved, what a great joy. Why do we give gifts at Christmas? Why do wars stop at Christmas? Why do things happen at Christmas? Because it is a season of joy. It's a season not of get, getting, but it's a season of re recognizing the Messiah, Jesus, had come into the world. That's what Christmas is all about. The truth of Christmas is that it was born in a manger, born in a barn, born in a cave there to bring to the world the King of kings and Lord of lords. In verse 74 and verse 75, we see his provision of government. To grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. We see a kingdom of resolve. Jesus' first coming was an operation of redemption. The Bible says to grant us that we be delivered from the hand of our enemies. We be delivered from sin. That we be delivered from death. And Jesus' first coming was that. He was to give us life everlasting. John 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. We were lost in sin and in darkness, beloved. Jesus the light came into this world and brought God's grace and mercy that we might be redeemed. We see Jesus' first coming, and then Jesus' second coming is an operation of rescue. To rescue the Jewish people, to establish the kingdom there in Jerusalem, to put his throne there in the temple, that he might rule and reign with you and I, the believers, the bride of Christ might rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Fearlessly serving the Lord, Jesus will come again to establish his kingdom on this earth. Psalm chapter 145 and verse 13 says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Folks, when I tell you that the Bible says that the kingdom shall not end, that's what the Bible means. There will come a time, folks, in this world, I don't know if we'll have a memory of it. I don't know if we'll remember this life. I don't know a thousand 10,000, 100,000 years from now, what we'll be doing, but we'll be in the kingdom that is to come. And we see the kingdom of resolve. And in verse 75, we see a kingdom of righteousness and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. That means eternity, throughout all eternity in the new heaven and the new earth. We see we're citizens of holiness Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 39 says, Then I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. That word fear is not the fear uh, such as phobia or the fear of, of something's going to happen. But that fear speaks of reverence. That we are going to have a pure reverence of God. That we'll be able to worship God in purity that we'll be able to worship God without sin, that our lives will be changed into a new world, citizens of holiness and conducts of holiness. 
will live holy lives in the kingdom. A thousand year reign of Jesus, a kingdom of true peace and holiness. Zechariah 14.20 says, In that day, holiness to the Lord, the band that was wore on the high priest, shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Everything will be holy because sin will be removed from those of us who've returned with him. The government of righteousness will not be a divine democracy. It will not be a divine monarchy. But rather it's going to be a divine theocracy. A government under the direct control of God. And Jesus will be our king. So who is this child as we see in verse 76? And you child will be called the prophet of the highest. Who was Zacharias talking to then? Who did God place upon his prophetic heart as he spoke this prophecy? Who was he speaking to but John the Baptist himself? Malachi 3, 1, Behold, I'll send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming says the Lord of hosts. John the Baptist, who was born a priest, would not fulfill that priesthood, that life of priesthood, but rather he would leave the priesthood and become a great prophet as he would preach and teach there in the wilderness, there by the river Jordan. And people would come from all around different places to hear the message of the coming of the Messiah. He was speaking of John, but then we see further in verse 76, for you will go before the face of the Lord, prepare his ways. He's going to go before the Lord and prepare his ways. That means he's going to go before the Messiah. And who is this Messiah? Who is this Lord? He's the one in the manger, the child of Bethlehem, Jesus Christ himself. We see his first advent. He came as the son of David, a savior, the king of kings, and Lord of Lords. His second advent, he'll come as the son of Abraham, a sovereign, the love grant blessed by God to bless the world. That's his first advent. And the land grant, the land of Israel, the kingdom, his second advent, to bring holiness and, and love and mercy and grace upon a world that was forever covered by sin. And so we see that this prophecy prophecy of Zacharias gives us a Christmas message and that Christmas message is simple there is a child coming and we see many years ago there in the stable of Bethlehem a place where the shepherds came and worshiped later on a couple of years later in the house three wise men came to worship this child born of a virgin born by the will of God, that we might know the Messiah has come and that he brought with him the peace of God and the forgiveness of sin. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, but more especially in this time, Father of decision, we thank you that that word has found a place in each and every heart. Oh, Father God, let that word grow. Let that word find a home that our hearts would be made glad and our lives would be changed, knowing that that little baby in the manger, oh, the one whom the songs are sung by, by believers and non-believers alike. That song is sung on radios, on TVs, or on different ways, Father God, in and, and CDs or DVDs or whatever. That song that is sung about Jesus, the babe in the manger, grew and became our Messiah, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let our hearts be made glad today. Let our hearts be made strong today as we praise and bring honor and glory to him who came as a servant to seek and to save that which was lost. And if there be anyone here today, Father God, that does not know that Savior, who's never received him as their Lord and Savior, let this be their day. 
There might be those who are watching on Facebook or those who are watching on YouTube who have never received him as their Savior. Let this be the day. Help us to understand, Father, first of all, that we're all sinners. We were all born that way. We were born as sinners bound for death and for hell. But Jesus came as the Son of God, born of a virgin there in Bethlehem to bring justification, to bring salvation to each and every one of us. Though the wages of sin is death, Father, we know that Jesus came to pay that price. There upon the cross, he carried our sins. And he rose from the dead after he died to give us life everlasting. And if we would but believe this and receive him as our Savior, we can be saved. Let them pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I confess and repent of my sins. And I believe, Jesus, that you are the Son of God and that you came to die for my sins and that you rose from the dead to give me life everlasting. I believe this, Jesus. And now I open the door of my heart and ask you to come into my life and save my soul. And to the best of my ability, Jesus, I'll live the rest of my life for you. And I will follow you the rest of my life. And, oh, Father God, for those who just prayed that prayer just now, let them make that decision public. For those who are watching on Facebook and on YouTube, let them speak to a family member or friend and say, I've received Jesus. Or let them come to a church service and make that decision public in a time of decision. Follow him in the waters of baptism and live the rest of their lives for him. Oh dear Jesus, we thank you that the greatest gift of Christmas is everlasting life in Jesus. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Yeah.